This morning, our scripture lesson comes to us from the Gospel according to St. Luke, the 17th chapter. We'll begin reading in the 11th verse. I invite those who are able to please stand for the reading of the Gospel. On the way to Jerusalem, Jesus was going through the region between Samaria and Galilee. As he entered a village, ten men with leprosy approached him. Keeping their distance, they called out, saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. When he saw them, he said to them, Go and show yourselves to the priest. And as they went, they were made clean. Then one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back, praising God with a loud voice. He prostrated himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. And he was a Samaritan. Then Jesus asked, were not ten made clean? So where are the other nine? Did none of them return to give glory to God except this foreigner? Then he said to him, Get up and go on your way. Your faith has made you well. This morning, as we have heard the word of God, let us affirm our faith in God in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. There's an ancient legend about two angels who had a very particular job. And their job was to fly to earth and gather up people's prayers into baskets and then take them back into heaven. And no matter where anyone was when they stopped to pray, the angel would come to receive the prayer, to, to put it in the basket and, and then get ready when the basket was full to take the basket back. Well, before long, the basket carried by one of the angels grew very heavy. It filled all the way up. It brimmed the, uh, the edge of the bowl. It began to, over, to spill out of the basket, and it was so many, so many prayers. But the basket carried by the other, other angel was still almost empty. Now, of course, I, you're probably already way ahead of me on this, but you can probably guess why one basket was full to overflowing and, and one basket was empty. One basket was filled with the petitions of people. Petitions offered in prayers, the, the requests that people made, the wants, the wishes, the needs, the shopping list, and so much more that people were asking for. And the other basket that was all almost empty, well, that was the basket that was supposed to receive the prayers of thank you. When someone asked the angel why the basket that he was carrying, why is your basket almost empty? He said, well, people are usually ready to pray for what they want, to ask for what they need, to ask for things that they don't need. But very few remember to give thanks to God. Even when God grants their request, very few remember to give thanks. They just move on. 
It seems that people forget or maybe refuse to say thank you. It's almost a, uh, a foreign thing in our world today. It's like we haven't changed much from the time when we were little. I remember when I was small and someone would give me something, a, a Christmas gift, a birthday gift, or, or anything else along the way. If it was something that I wanted, something I'd asked for, something I was excited about, then I would take it and I would tear off running toward my bedroom to play. And somewhere in the background, my, one of my parents, my mother, my father, one of them would have to yell out and stop me asking me that question. Bill, what do you say? And as I ran off and continued into my bedroom, I quite often would yell over my shoulder, thank you. Real heartfelt, real genuine. I guess as a kid, I, I, wasn't, I really wasn't much better than the nine, the nine of the lepers in the story that we just read from the gospel. If, not, if I'm not careful, to be honest, if, if I'm not careful, I still like the same way today. Get so caught up in what I want, what I need, and what I might need next, what I might want next, that I forget to stop and say thank you. You see, we can find ourselves in this story. Now, I know we oftentimes when we read the parables that Jesus tells, we try to figure out where we fit in that story. And most of us like to put ourselves on the good side of the story. Very few of us want to put ourselves over where the person is weeping and gnashing teeth. Uh, we don't pick the weeping and gnashing side of the story. We go to the good side and say, well, maybe, maybe we're like that. Well, this is one of those stories we can all find our place. We can all find ourselves in this story. The difference is whether we are one of the nine in the story or if we're the one in the story. The story begins, as he entered a certain village, he met ten lepers and they stood a far distance from him and called out. Ten lepers. In my opinion... That's a lot of lepers. I mean, that's more lepers than I, I probably would want to meet at one time. Well, one leper may be more than I want to meet at one time. But ten seems like a lot. But they had banded together in their plight. I mean, they, they walked the earth. They breathed. They ate. But in so many ways, it just was like they weren't anymore. At one point in their life, they, they had hopes and dreams. They had aspirations. They may have had family and friends and, and so many plans for the future. But then one day, the first symptom appeared. The first symptom that, that might be, could be, possibly be leprosy. And now, they're like the walking dead. Cast out to Rome, no more welcomed in their village, no more welcomed in their own homes, cast out to Rome. They moved across the countryside in that era of time. They would move across the countryside looking for caravans that might be coming through. Because, see, they hoped that there would be someone in the caravan that would be wealthy enough that when they cried out and asked for help, that that person might give them a little food or, or give them a, an article of clothing or, or drop a few coins on the side of the road that they could have. I mean, Scripture made it clear that no one could get near them. The law, the law of the people, of the Jewish people, was that, that when anyone approached, they had to stay as far away as they could. And so even as Jesus approaches, they stand at their distance. You see, a leper could not get near a clean person. Everywhere these poor men wandered, they had to yell out and announce themselves in the most humiliating way. They had to announce, unclean, unclean, leper, leper. Because you see, leprosy was not just a public health issue in the Jewish faith in that time. It was also a religious issue because it made them unclean in the eyes of the Jewish temple. 
So they were unclean and they were a leper. And so the ten come and they find Jesus. I guess, I guess we could consider what Jesus and his friends moving probably was like a caravan. I mean, after all, it would have been Jesus and 12 disciples. It would have also been the women who helped to take care of them. And it would have been the, the crowd that seemed to always be present. And so I guess in a way it was a caravan coming through led by this, this rabbi, Jesus. And as they come close, keeping their distance still, they're yelling, unclean, leper. And then Jesus, have mercy on us. And Jesus stops. And he tells them, go and present yourselves to the priest. Because according to the law again, if you happen to be cleansed or healed from leprosy, then you went and presented yourself to the priest and the priest would deem you healthy and you could go home again. And so these men turn and start to walk. And as they're going, they're made clean. They're healed. And the story says that one of them, a Samaritan, when he realizes what Jesus has done, when he realizes that he's been healed, he comes back praising God and throwing himself at Jesus' feet, giving thanks for all that he had received. One. One came back to say thank you. Like I said, we're probably all in this story. We're either one of the nine, and when we get what we want, what we need, what we asked for, we run off to go on, move on to the next thing, or we're like the one who remembers to actually go back and say thank you, to say thank you. Gratitude is an amazing thing. And it's something that we should do, something that we should practice, something that we should develop. It's a, it seems like it doesn't come naturally, so it's something that we should work on. And especially, we should learn to give thanks to God, to develop an attitude of being grateful to God for each and everything that happens, from the big things like family and friends and church and country to the even bigger things like the breath you just breathed and the heart that's beating in you. Hopefully we reach that point where we could learn and develop this skill of gratitude so that we could give God thanks anytime in any place regardless of our circumstance because we know that God is with us. And even when things are bad, God can help us find the good. A new study shows that expressing gratitude affects not only the person that's grateful, but it actually will affect the people that witness that person being grateful. Researchers studying gratitude have found that, that being thankful and expressing it to others is really good for our health and our happiness. But they also found that when you express it, not only does it improve your one-to-one -one relationship with someone else, but it also affects those who witness you being grateful. They found when people witness an expression of gratitude, they see that person in a different light. And it is inspiring. And most of those that they followed in the study, most will respond with an act of gratitude themselves. It's like paying it forward in a way. But unfortunately, we often have the attitude that, we have the idea that there's no reason why we should say thank you. So we don't. So often we're overly confident we overestimate our ability. We have inflated our sense of what we deserve. In today's world, we call that a sense of entitlement. That we deserve the things we have. 
the things that we are blessed with, the things we receive, we deserve them. So why would we need to be grateful? The reality is we don't deserve. We don't deserve the blessings we've received. All we have and all we are is a gift to us from our very generous and loving God. In the story, one leper comes back to say thank you to Jesus. And that, that leper was a Samaritan. And that's big. Anytime in Scripture when Jesus talks about the good Samaritan, and now in this story, a Samaritan, where a Samaritan is the one leper that comes back, that's big. Because Samaritans were hated by the Jewish people. And the Samaritans hated the Jewish people. The Samaritans were considered an inferior group of people. They, they didn't live in the right place. They didn't worship in the right way. They worshiped on Mount Gerizim in Samaria. They didn't go down to Jerusalem and worship at the temple. And that was just deemed wrong. And so because of that, the Jewish people were not bound by any law to help them. There's no law of hospitality that would, that would apply to them. The Jewish people didn't owe a Samaritan person anything. So the leper, when they cry out, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us, the leper probably didn't expect anything from this rabbi. Jesus. He probably would have been ecstatic if he would have just gotten maybe a, a little piece of, of bread or, or, or maybe an article of clothing. But instead of giving him the minimum or giving him nothing, Jesus gives him everything. Jesus heals him. Jesus gives him his life back. But the difference between that Samaritan and the other lepers, I think the Samaritan knew he didn't deserve anything. And so when he got something, he was overwhelmed. And he was thankful. Thankful. And he had to go back and express his gratitude to the one who had blessed him, even though he didn't deserve it. I always love to share the, the opening part of that passage early on from Defoe's Robinson Crusoe. When Crusoe arrives on the island and he's shipwrecked there and, and he decides he's going to make a list. He's going to make a list of all of his problems now that he's on this island. And on one side of the list, he wrote down his problems. And on, on the other side of the list, he wrote down his blessing. And so he wrote things like, I don't have any clothes. And on the other side, but it's warm and I really don't need any clothes. On one side, all the provisions were lost. On the other side, but there's plenty of fresh fruit and clean water on the island. And the list just kept going and going. It was amazing. He discovered that for every negative that he listed, well, there was a positive that he found as well. Something that, that he could be thankful for in that situation. I think our problem can often be that, well, far too often, we only make one list. We only make the list of our problems. We focus there. We focus on what we don't have. We obsess over what we feel is wrong. You see, that's how we're wired. We're, we're, we're wired, it seems, to remember the bad. It's a built-in survival tactic that we all have within us. We remember what goes wrong. We remember the negative so that we can protect ourselves going forward because if we can remember the negative, then we can avoid the negative next time. If we can remember the bad, then we can avoid the bad. So that's why when people talk to us at times and they ask us something like, how was your vacation? And maybe it was the best vacation we ever had. But we find ourselves quickly talking about that hotel. The one hotel that we stayed in that was subpar to the other ones. We suddenly start talking about that hotel. 
or we start talking about, well, the food on the ship was not as good as the food on the last ship we were on. Or we talk about travel and maybe construction on the road and traffic jams or we suddenly find ourselves not talking about the amazing vacation. We're talking about what went wrong. And we do that in almost every aspect of our life. We go to the bad. Sometimes when we remember moments in our life, moments that were wonderful, we almost can't remember them because we get fixated on the pieces that didn't work the parts that weren't perfect. The reality is we have so much to be thankful for. We just have to work on that wiring so that we can be thankful. I think there's an exercise I, I would encourage everyone to try. It's called the top three things. Every morning when you wake up, think about the previous day. Think about the previous day. Doing, it, doing this in the morning allows you to have slept on whatever happened the previous day. You've had a little time. You've distanced yourself a little bit. you got a little perspective. And so in the morning when you wake up, think about the previous day and name the top three things for which you're grateful. It might be the sunset that you saw. It might be a visit with a friend. It might be the good parking space when you went to the store. It might be something big. Or it might be something really simple. Like a, you ate something that reminded you of, of sitting in your grandmother's house when you were little. Or you smelled the flowers and they were your mother's favorite flowers. It could be something little. It could be something big. What were those top three things? things. Studies show that if we do this exercise for 21 days, we can actually start rewiring how we think. Because we get in the habit of, of if we know the next morning, we're going to be asking ourselves, what were the top three things yesterday for which I'm grateful? And I'm about to pray and thank God for these three things. Well, when we go through our day, we'll start looking for them. We'll start noticing them. We'll start trying and we'll start finding ourselves thinking, I bet that's going to be one of my top three things tomorrow. Like when we're stuck in traffic and we're frustrated because even though it happens every day, it seems to surprise us whenever it happens. We're stuck in traffic. But rather than being mad and rather than throwing the fit we usually throw, we remember that well, I've got probably 20 minutes here that I, I have nothing else to do other than sit. And we call that friend that we haven't talked to in forever. We've been trying to get together with them and it just hasn't worked out. I'm going to call them and we're going to talk. We reach out to a family member. And we just listen to them share about their day. We suddenly find ourselves finding ways to take something bad and and trying to see if it could be one of our top three things the next morning. You see, I imagine there's many of us here this morning that are long overdue in expressing ourselves, our thanks to God. I mean, after all, have you thanked God yet because you woke up this morning? Or that you're breathing right now? Have you thanked God for indoor plumbing and fresh water that, that just, it works. It flows right out of a tap, fresh water, when there's so many people in our world that would love to have that. Have you thanked God for the freedom to choose what you're going to do today? Yes, there might be limitations, but you have choices. Have you thanked God yet for the fact that there's you can find food for three meals a day, plus snacks along the way. That you have a home, that you have resources, that you have the opportunity to sleep indoors when it rains and when it's cold and when it's hot. The list goes on and on and on. How many of those things do we take for granted? How many of those things do we think that we just deserve? And how many of those things have we stopped and thanked God for them? 
will we say thank you? You see, it's not that hard to come up with three. Three things, top three things a day. Last year after Thanksgiving, there was a a Gallup poll that was conducted. It once again confirmed that among Americans who celebrated Thanksgiving and, and sat down to a Thanksgiving meal, turkey was once again the most popular food at a Thanksgiving meal last year. And the least popular thing, food at a Thanksgiving meal, mincemeat pie. I'm sorry, I know in the 830 service, I offended some of the mincemeat lovers in the world. Uh, I heard from a few of them. Uh, Not many, but a few. So, it confirmed those things. But the poll also said that while the majority of the people they polled said that they will as a, as a group around a table or, or wherever they're eating, they will name things that they are thankful for or should be thankful for. Things like family was number one and health and, and new job opportunities or, or different things like that all make the list. The poll found that nine out of ten American families did not offer a prayer of thanksgiving as they sat down to their Thanksgiving meal on the holiday that we set aside to offer Thanksgiving to God. Nine out of ten American families did not offer a prayer of Thanksgiving on Thanksgiving. Again, are we one of the nine or are we the one? This week, as we approach Thanksgiving, I hope you will start practicing the top three things. Naming the top three things from the day before for which you are grateful. And then offering a prayer of thanksgiving to God for those things. This will get you warmed up for Thursday. And just just think, if you keep it going after Thursday... And do this each morning as we move through the holiday season, as we're moving toward Christmas, you could actually start rewiring the way you think. Be on your way to developing a spirit of gratitude, a new way of looking at your life by the time we celebrate Christmas. What a gift that would be. We've all been blessed by God. We've been given more than we deserve in big ways and small ways, but we have to decide, are we one of the nine or are we the one? As we think about our blessings in life and as we move our way toward Thanksgiving this week, maybe we need to be reminded of that question that we were probably all asked at one time or more when we were young. What do you say? What do you say? It's time that we learn to stop and from the heart say thank you. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. This morning as we sing our closing hymn, number 84, now thank we all our God. If you have made the decision to make this your church home, then I invite you to come forward as we sing the second verse. Let us stand now and sing together.